Many people, including Prince Charles. Friends and family look back now on BBC Two at his life and work. Sir Lawrence van der Post became widely known in the 50s through his films and books about the Bushmen of Southern Africa. This is the story of a journey I've just made in Africa with the help of the BBC. It's a story of a long desert journey and the search for survivors of the almost vanished and forgotten first people of Africa, the Bushmen. After the war, Lawrence van der Post spent over three years exploring the Bundu, remote and unknown areas of Central and Southern Africa for the British government. Out of those journeys came his books, Venture to the Interior, Lost World of the Kalahari and Heart of the Hunter, as well as a pioneering series of documentary films for the BBC. What you see laid out on this skin, the bow, the bark quiver, the arrows, the spear, the ostrich egg shell for water, the satchel for the shell, are all a bushman ever possesses. Back in the 50s, when television was new, suddenly there appeared this series of extraordinary films about the bushmen. I mean, the world is now so small, it's impossible really for anyone today to know just what an extraordinary thing it was. I was sort of in my mid-teens at the time, and they were just not like anything one had seen on television before, and just the, the spirit of the way Lawrence was talking about the Bushmen and what they stood for made enormous impact on me. Another of Lawrence's close friends was farmer, conservationist and writer Robin Page. Lawrence called him his English Bushman. I first remember him, I think, on television in the little nine-inch black and white screen we had at the time uh, when he did The Lost World of the Kalahari. Uh, and it struck a chord with me because he was dealing with these endangered people who had got their special lifestyle. Uh, and you could also see a special relationship that he had uh, with the Bushmen. And then I got to reading him uh, and this relationship became more clear. But as I got older, it became obvious to me uh, that here in Britain, we had our problem with the culture of country people being squeezed out as well. And then I became aware of other cultures worldwide where the country people, whether it is the Bushman, um, the rainforest Indian, or the English peasant of whom I'm about the last, um, are getting squeezed out and having other cultures imposed on them. Uh, and so it really did strike a chord. What he was able to do was to see what it was in their relationship with nature, with each other, their whole world view. We can see in that what we have lost. When we're trying to puzzle out why our present world is in such a mess, we can see that in very many ways, why we are making such a muck of it and why we're so alienated from ourselves and why we are, you know, making an ugly, noisy, disgusting, polluted mess of the world and why we are so unhappy deep, deep down, why we've lost our way spiritually, is because we have lost all those things for which the Bushmen stood. Now, of course, Lawrence would have not said any more than anyone else would that we should go back to that kind of very primitive thing. You can't recapture lost innocence. That's the whole point about innocence. Once it's lost, it's gone. But what you can do is understand what the values were in that innocence, which one can try then consciously to re-establish some contact with in oneself. Lawrence first came to London at the age of 22. He lived in Chelsea for over 60 years, but returned regularly to his native South Africa. He died a year ago, aged 90. In 1986, I made a programme to mark his 80th birthday. We'd already worked together on films about the mythology of the Bushmen and on the life of C.G. Jung. In 1981, he'd been knighted for public services. He worked unofficially for various British governments since the last war, an involvement in what he loosely called 
the emancipation of the British Empire. The van der Posts were a pioneering Afrikaner family. Lawrence was the 13th of 15 children and was born on the 13th of December 1906. Despite his attachment to Britain, despite writing in English, according to those close to him, he remained at heart an Afrikaner, a citizen of Africa. I've got an intense feeling of belonging, an intense feeling of belonging to the desert and to the bush and to the world of nature. That is profoundly strong, and it gets scurrious enough, it gets stronger as I get older. This is where he was so complex, you see. I think he, he loved Britain, he felt deeply attached to it. And yet he was African, but yet he could never have lived in Africa. He said that to me often. He, and it w wasn't just because he married an English woman that he lived here. He felt, I think he felt psychologically at ease here and perhaps physically at ease in Africa. I've never thought of it that, that way before. But, and I think in the end, psychological ease meant more to him than physical ease. He loved Africa and felt deeply African, but he always said to me he couldn't live. Lawrence remained involved with Africa all his life. He campaigned against racial prejudice from an early age and gave his support to the conservation movement, in particular to the work of his friend Ian Player. Somebody sent me his book, uh, Venture to the Interior. Uh, that's how I really first met Lawrence. And the book made an enormous impression upon me. Um, because it explained things to me that I really did not know. I'd been going through a period of searching, trying to find out more about you know, what, it, what it was about Africa that was so compelling. Um, and of course, having worked in wild places for the last, uh, well, 20 years in one way or another, uh, I still hadn't found an answer. But Lawrence's book gave me an enormous insight. The parable of life as a journey, both an inward journey and an outward journey, that is told beautifully the story of that in Venture to the Interior, which is the first book that really made his name. Um, but I also think that it, it also reflected this great, great belief, which he f it emerges in his very first book um, in a province, that the individual matters and that no matter what the cause, it can never be the right thing to sacrifice the individual for a greater cause. His love of the Bushmen was their particularity, that they, they were as valuable, as important, as interesting, as much larger, more forceful societies. And indeed, he felt that they were more so because they were, in some essence, less corrupted, less polluted by modern commercial values. Um, value isn't measured in quantity or material worth. Their value was hugely important to all of us. Kangana, kaite, kaite, kum, kaite, kum, kangana, kangana, kaite, kum. I have been saying to this insect here what the first man of Africa said to him in the beginning. Because we are in the presence here of something which is for me one of the most moving demonstrations of the importance of man's relationship with nature. The elephant, the lion, the buffalo, even the crocodile in the religions of Africa play an immense role. But here in southern Africa, where man's association with nature was the longest and the least disturbed, man's imagination was inflamed by this insect sitting here now listening to me in an attitude of prayer which gave him the name of the praying mantis. And the Bushman picked on him because he learned from nature that there was nothing so important in nature as the small. That it was only by giving the utmost reverence to what was apparently small 
and defenseless that one achieved spiritually what was great and significant. And this insect inspired the greatest legends and myths which are in our possession in Africa today. Lawrence was always prepared to help. He was always prepared to help the, the small things. And, and, and this I'm sure that he got from the Bushmen. I mean, he was not, um, I mean, he, he was involved in big issues. But when you came to him with what to most people would be something small, Lawrence always saw the value. Uh, and this was particularly so with me and the, and the Wilderness Leadership School, which was a very small organization. But Lawrence immediately understood what we were trying to do. In 1978, Lawrence's 19-year-old granddaughter, Emma, came to Africa to experience Ian Player's Wilderness School, a 10-day trek into the bush and in the company of her grandfather. I suppose the main thing about him as a grandfather was that he didn't talk down to you at all. Lawrence had this tremendous gift for focusing entirely on the person he was with at the moment. And certainly, as a, as a grandchild, you felt completely unpatronized. The largest part of Africa was dominated by a little Aboriginal man who lived entirely a hunter's relationship. And he lived entirely dependent on game. And like the game, he kept to the proportions of the natural situation. But the whole thing was still manageable from nature's point of view mm. until we started moving in from the south and then the slaughter really began. It was extraordinary being there with him, being in that landscape and seeing the landscape and the animals in the way that Lawrence saw them was a tremendous privilege. It meant that you never just looked at the landscape as a kind of a panorama that was out there. You were very much aware of being in it. And I was very much aware of the way that Lawrence felt about landscapes and Africa and the wild animals and birds and also plants that we were among. So that was a tremendous gift for a 19-year-old, really, to have that relationship to a place conveyed so strongly. I suppose it's of a piece with his kind of his mythic sense of nature, but also his mythic sense of the human relationship to nature. So that there were lots of stories that you wouldn't just be told about um, a plant. There would be a story about a plant, every animal. There was a story behind it. And it wasn't just a sort of phenomenon you ticked off on a book and sort of said, I, I've seen this. <coughs> In the beginning, the old people told me when Kung Kung, the great spirit, was first allocating places for all the animals in the world in which to live, the first hippopotamus couple came to Kung Kung. And this Adam and Eve of the hippopotamus world said, Ngung Ngung, you know, of all the things in the world, we love water best. Water is the only element in which we can possibly live. Please allow us to live in the water. And Ngung Ngung said, look, hippopotamus, I simply can't do it. Look at your big mouth. Look at those sharp teeth of yours. If I let you live in the water, you'll eat up all the fish. And the hippo said, Ngung Ngung, if you will let us live in the water, we will make a pact with you. We'll promise you that we will never eat any fish and that every morning we'll come out on land and we'll scatter our dung with our tails so that you can see there are no fish bones in it. And to this day, the hippopotamuses all over Africa continue to do that very thing. I always remember something he said to me which was really rather wonderful. People would say, well, how can you mind about a fly? And um, how can you think that animals are more important than people? And 
The phrase that he used, which absolutely sticks in my mind because it goes to the root of the problem in my view, is he said at the end of the day, it's a religious matter. Reverence for life is a religious matter. You can't separate it. And people have lost their reverence for all life, for accepting the pattern that nature gave us and that we shouldn't approach it with this arrogance that we can dispose of this and dispose of that and pick and choose. It's, it's a whole pattern that we should revere and honour. And that is why the world is, certainly environmentally, the world is sick at heart. He would also say spiritually the world is sick at heart. People don't seem to realise that Lawrence's interest in conservation, uh, wildlife, people, the welfare of the planet, did cover the entire planet. It was not just focused on Africa. He farmed in England for many years between the wars, and he understands the, the British countryside. And so his interest in conservation uh, goes far, far beyond the Bushmen. And we were talking the same language about the damage being done uh, to the British countryside, uh, to its wildlife, to its landscape, to its people and to the soul of farming. I became really worried at the whole process of the destruction of the general countryside uh, and, and with it the belief that you should have nature reserves, that is islands for nature and the rest you don't care about nature because it seemed to me that you should have wildlife in every parish and every meadow as it was when I was a boy uh, and this is not being sentimental or nostalgic I honestly believe you can produce food you can stay in touch with nature and you can have beautiful things as well and Lawrence believed this passionately too that we should get back to actually being in touch that if we ploughed a field and skylarks were in it we're aware of their needs as well as the needs to grow food. And so we came up with the idea of forming the Countryside Restoration Trust and I said to Lawrence, will you be a trustee? The aim is to buy devastated land in this country and to restore it and he straight away said yes. And he was very supportive, spoke to me about what we should aim for, what we should do, how we should do it. And when I used to go to London, I would go in and talk to him about our progress. And his first words always were, how is the trust going? What are you doing? And we launched in 1993. We bought 40 acres. This field is a tribute to it and to Lawrence, because from a monoculture, we have got this. You can hear the birds all around us, full of birds. We've taken the floodplain out of production. It's wild back to nature for barn owls and things like that it will get grazed occasionally with the actual crop we've got an unsprayed headland and all these wildflowers and our tenant farmer is totally caught up in what we're doing he loves it so we've got insects we've got butterflies we've got flowers and the main crop over there grass margin all the way round spinny up there too we've got rare butterflies coming back we've got grass snakes we've got otters in the stream and in a matter of four years we have got species coming back and it is wonderful the countryside restoration trust was only one of very many charities that lawrence supported he was approached increasingly by a wide variety of people and organisations and particularly by those who admired his acknowledgement and respect for the spiritual dimension to life. Back in the 30s in Gloucestershire, he himself had become a farmer in flight from the London literary scene. He'd already written his first novel and at a time when many of his young friends were becoming communists, his book explored the dilemma of the individual in relation to the collective. Inner Province was also a powerful attack on colour prejudice in South Africa. It was not his first nor his last such stab. I think his experiences in the 30s were very searing for him. Um, obviously this was all before I really was conscious. Um, he married very young and he loved my mother but he was really too young to have married. 
and they had my brother, who was eight years older than I, very young. I mean, I think he was 21, my father. And I think that he found that search for himself, for knowing what his path in life should be, very difficult, because they were hounded by money worries. He was worried as to how he could fund family domestic life and at the same time become a writer. And I think that was the source of his affection for somebody like Prince Charles and somebody like his nephew Tom and other young men was that he sort of identified with the difficulties that young men sometimes find in finding their own way in life. And I think that was important. And then, of course, the war. The war was clearly an absolute turning point in his life and some of his noblest writing. I think The Night of the New Moon is a stunning book. And the no nobility of that thinking was all forged, really, in the crucible of the war. I think it was the defining experience of his life, the war. In 1942, Lawrence was taken prisoner by the Japanese. As a young man, he'd visited Japan and learned a little of the language. It probably saved his life. The film, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, was based on the book he wrote about his three and a half years in prison camp now a colonel and 35 years old. In The Seed and the Sower, Lawrence explores from the prisoner's point of view the psychology of the Japanese, and in particular their attitude to death. For them, he believed, death was a form of rebirth. For the Japanese, it is almost more important how you die than how you live, he wrote. William Griffiths did live, but aged 21, he lost both arms and his sight after being made to clear a minefield by his captors. I was just a young lad, of course, very humble young lad, and uh, I felt pretty hopeless, pretty desperate within me, wondering what on earth I could make of my situation. But Colonel Van der Post, as we knew him then, was there, and he was such a comfort, you know, it was like a little bit of security amidst an awful lot of insecurity, and uh, he, he conveyed that to me all the way through. There was something that, that, that made me feel safe about him. I used to say, well, how can I go on like this? No sight, no hands. So I said, well, Billy, it's amazing, you know. He said that he knew people that were blind and deaf and all sorts of injuries. And they, they, they meant something of their lives, and uh, he said, I would, I would raise just in time, it would take time. As a matter of fact, at the beginning, I was so fed up, I wouldn't have minded if they had polished me off quickly. I was so fed up. Anything could have happened, you, you know. It's, uh, they were a very precarious, very precarious business, and, uh, and, and um, Colonel Van der Poss, as we know, would say something to them in Japanese, which I'm sure often, often helped, you know. He gave me a little job later on. And that was running messages. I used to stick them in a pocket I had somewhere and, and off I would trot. But now that was very, very useful to me. You know, it was, me, it was being so helpful there. And then often when I got back to my little sleeping spot, my fellow prisoners of war would tell me, say, you know, uh, Colonel Van der Post was watching you walking, walking around and things like that. So there again, I always felt he, he had his eye on me. He was watching over me somewhere. It was a, a pretty miserable existence, but uh, chatting to him brightened life up a little somewhat. I felt uh, better for knowing him, for knowing that he was there. But neither Colonel van der Post nor anyone else would have been able to prevent the massacre of all prisoners planned to coincide with the Allies' main attack on Southeast Asia. Then came the atomic bomb. The Night of the New Moon, which I've just reread, is his own perspective on the importance or the significance of the dropping of, of the bomb on Hiroshima and then on Nagasaki. And um, to me, there's nothing to beat it for for the nobility of the views, for the, the way in which suffering can be turned into something much nobler than it ever was, and for looking at the complexity of the roots 
um, of war, at the roots of the dark side in all of us, and offering a very fine hope to people how to, how, how to deal with these things that are part of everybody's life. After the Japanese surrender in September 1945, Lawrence had two more years of war, working for the British government as mediator in Indonesia. His last book, The Admiral's Baby, describes this very challenging period in his life. In 1947, he was awarded the CBE. With him at Buckingham Palace was the analyst and playwright Ingrid Giffard. She was soon to become his second wife, and it was through Ingrid that Lawrence met the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung. On the lake near Zurich, Jung's retreat at Bollingen. He always said and he said so in public, that one of the troubles with modern man was that modern man had forgotten how to live the symbols in himself, how he'd forgotten to live the symbolic life. And how, for instance, he had found that even in the poorest house in India, there was always a tiny little corner which was regarded as private and sacred, to which the personality could withdraw and where it could be at one with life and the universe. And this, he lived out here himself. I think the whole point about Jung is you mustn't get stuck in what Jung was on about. Because, I mean, Jung himself didn't, didn't resolve the whole <laughs> problem of human existence. What he did do was provided some wonderful, I mean, absolutely extraordinary insights into the way that we all work. And you have to really uh, to go through that and come out the other side. Now, I mean, Lawrence was not in any sense a Jungian. He knew Jung as a friend, and he obviously had a very great, uh, huge reverence for it. The thing I always remember about uh, Lawrence's writings and talking about Jung was how, imp uh, how he, used to, um, he used to talk about Jung's laugh. And, I mean, in a way, that's rather the key, that uh, Lawrence could approach Jung, who was surrounded by a lot of very faux-faced devotees who regarded him as sort of God on earth. And there was Lawrence, who didn't regard him as God on earth, and therefore he, he was quite able to have the kind of conversation which would provoke that, that laugh. His whole life had been a dialogue, a dialogue with the sick, a dialogue with his own unconscious, a dialogue with the whole history of man. And only here did he have the inner silence for the final dialogue. From Bollingen he wrote to me, I cannot define for you what God is, but I can tell you that my work has proved that the pattern of God exists in every man. I've heard him talk about them. Uh, but he wouldn't call them failings. He would call them part of the larger picture, which is, of course, what they are. Lawrence, it appears, also had his failings. The larger picture reveals a man who, as he got older, had an increasing tendency to hold forth dogmatically, yet resented the label guru. From his own retreat on the Suffolk coast at Alborough, he continued to write, but allowed very little editing. There were certain things about which he was completely intemperate and you just didn't talk about them. I mean, towards the end, he got very impatient with newspapers, the sort of shallowness of newspapers and the shallowness of the media and that everybody had got the wrong end of the stick about the situation in South Africa um, and, and whatever. And he wouldn't listen to any alternative opinion, really. Um, this sort of the other side of a capacity for telling stories is a kind of... Um, a forcefulness of myth-making which won't brook contradiction, really, so that he will have formed within himself an idea of a situation and um, it will have become so powerful a story that any alternative opinion just is given no room. 
the story just sweeps on over it. I think that he did have trouble, like most of us, in admitting his shadow side. Um, he really, he was incredibly sensitive to criticism. He would, he would shrink, he hated it. He really, he really did feel obliged to be as wonderful as he wanted to be. And I think this is a problem we all of us have. We all have great difficulties admitting that there are areas in which um, we are less than perfect. For the last 15 years of his life, Lawrence's secretary was Jane Bedford, married to his nephew, Tom. He answered all the letters himself. And I used to joke and say, because uh, th very many of the letters were from people asking him to do things, uh, send him things or appear somewhere, do something for them, be a patron. And um, he's, he used to write such wonderful letters of refusal because, you know, he didn't have time to do all the things. He would have loved to, but he didn't have time. And I often said that his letters of refusal were so wonderful, <laughs> they would have been be better than most other people's yes, you know, a no from him was such a, such a, a wonderful no. It must have taken a lot of his time. Did he resent that? Um, yes and no, in that he used to grumble about it um, in theory, but in in fact, when he was actually dealing with each letter, his heart was totally in it, and he never did anything automatically. He always gave it his, his complete attention and his, the best, his best possible reply. Um, there was never anything automatic. There was never a standard letter that we always sent to him, or nothing like that. Of course, since the war, Sir Lawrence has been, um, as I say, kept in touch, but. Uh, on family matters too, family affairs, like our son recently, was a couple of years ago, was very ill, very ill, had heart attack and cold and removed and terrible troubles with his wife, they were worried. And Sir Lawrence wrote to them several times, again, to give encouragement, and, uh, and they were thrilled to bits, coming from him, long letters, I remember, a couple of long letters, didn't he? Yeah. And it uh, was written to us, written to my wife Alice here, and, uh, it's really kept in touch, taken a, an interest, a real live interest in our lives. He was particularly fond of Billy, um, so he took special trouble, but he took special trouble with a lot, of, a lot of people too. Many people turned to him for help and for advice, and he tried to help where he could. And I imagine one day a book will be written when some of these things will come out. And, um, I mean, I don't think it's generally known, but, for example, in the Zimbabwean conflict, the old Rhodesian problem, right at the death, they couldn't get uh, the sides to agree. And Lawrence was called here in London, and a meeting was held with him and the Lancaster House talks fell into place and the Rhodesian problem was, was resolved. Now, things like that happened in South Africa too. Already back in the 20s in Durban, the young journalist Lawrence van der Post was caught up in South African politics. He remained so for the rest of his life. With two other young idealistic writers, the poet Roy Campbell and William Plumer, he started a magazine called Vorschlag, it means literally the lash of the whip. It was an early stab at the rising problem of colour prejudice in South Africa. Opposition even then was such that it was closed after three issues. There is no doubt in my mind that right uh, from the time that he was a, a journalist, Lawrence played a part in transforming, uh, helping to transform South Africa. His book, uh, In a Province, was years ahead of Alan Payton's um, cried the beloved country, but it really it, uh, it addressed the same the same uh, subject. He cared passionately about South Africa, really passionately, and he felt that most of the world saw it through rather skewed vision. They had this kind of blanket view, um, a simplistic view. They divided to harshly in ways that 
really hid the complexity of the situation. And I know that the thing he felt most deeply about was that it was fundamentally a pluralistic society, that it wasn't simply a question of black versus white, that it was a very pluralistic society, that all those differences should be honoured and gloried and represented in the Constitution. And he minded very much that it went into this first fully democratic election without a constitution. He was quite despondent about South Africa towards the end. He felt, you know, he had done everything that he possibly could to try and help the new South Africa on the way, and yet the foundation wasn't as good as it could have been. One had replaced one bad system under the old Nationalist Party, the old apartheid system, with, with, a, with a very similar system. And he felt in the whole makeup of the country and, and its history, there should have been a chance for a more federal system rather than a unitary system in political terms. Um, and that the, the essence of democracy, which would also apply to South Africa, particularly to South Africa, was that the smallest units, the little atom, the smallest groupings, the individual, uh, should be looked after. That, that, that was what the essence of a, of, a, of a new South Africa should be about. But instead, it's gone to, again, one group gathering all the power and keeping all the power and thinking that that is democracy. By force of numbers. By force of numbers. The minorities that he particularly felt were not being catered for were the Zulus and the Afrikaners. I mean, enormously powerful minorities in the country that couldn't be left out uh, and, and yet were and, and still are to a great extent. Through the birds, man was made aware of one of the great perils that threatened his communities in the beginning, the peril of numbers. He would notice that whenever birds congregate most, like these common weaver birds, their standards decline. They build their nests so badly that within days of completion, a gust of wind brings many of them down. Do you feel that at the end of his life he was a, a disappointed man? No, I don't think that. But what I do think is that certain things began to hurt him. He minded very much that once his great friendship with Prince Charles came to be known, that people concentrated on that, the press concentrated on that to the exclusion of almost anything else, and that his writing was never taken seriously again, or only a few people took it seriously. People would often comment to me on Lawrence's age and his vitality and his memory and say, what's the secret? You know, tell me what vitamins does he take? What's his diet? You know, there must, he must have discovered something. And um, they were always very surprised when I said that his two passions were coffee. He drank gallons of coffee every day and chocolate. He was like a little boy with chocolates. He loved them. He had them in every drawer in his desk, under the cushions on the sofa, under his pillow at night. The housekeeper would complain about the chocolates so <laughs> uh, that she would find in his bed. So um, far from being a spinach-eating sort of health guru, those were his two passions. Howlett's Animal Park in Kent. Its founder, John Aspinall, became a close friend towards the end of Lawrence's life. Oh, he's having a game. Yeah. And the difference is he's an elephant and I'm an old man. But uh, he's enjoying it and I'm pretending to. That's the difference between us. <laughs> so Lawrence and I became kind of instant friends, if you like, uh, though he was older than me. Great friends, which is very rare, 
because normally friendship takes a long time to construct and many years have to pass before you can become a friend of somebody, a proper friend. Whatever we discussed, we seem to have the same view. And we could talk about the Zulus or the Bushmen or wild nature. And so on that basis, I found a friend. And um, that was very refreshing and very reinforcing and strengthened me a lot. I used to gain strength from seeing him. I went around there for selfish reasons. I wanted him to, um, uh, to affirm, reaffirm my own view that I myself was on the right path. And this is what he did. To some extent, it must have worked the other way as well to find a younger man who thought as he thought, who dreamed as he dreamed, whose vision was his vision. As man joined all living things in making for the nearest shelter against the impending storm, a feeling of awe possessed his senses and protected him from exceeding the measure of his human proportions in the scale of things. I think his contribution to conservation in a sort of specialist sense was by reinforcing the efforts of people spiritually who were doing that work, like Ian Clare and myself and, and others, because they would go to him to find out if they were doing the right thing. And he would say, yes, you're the wonderful leader. And, 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 and that's where he, I don't think he was actually protecting great tracts of country himself, or he had never been a game ranger or anything. He hadn't come up that way. But, but um, he gave great strength to people in that field, philosophical and moral and almost spiritual strength to the people trying to protect wild nature to say, you're doing the right thing. He wasn't so much involved with uh, conservation in the end for conservationist's sake. He was more, I think, involved with the conservation of the soul. It was a spiritual conservation. And, and of course, the two were interrelated. He felt that you, um, that you, you didn't um, do anything to the earth outside yourself, you know, to, to the planet, that you were not also doing to your own yeah. spirit. So areas that you destroyed, species that you allowed to become extinct, um, th uh, things were, that were despoiled in your outer world had their equivalent um, in, in the spirit, and that that's where the important uh, destruction was taking place. We live in a culture, in an age, when there are very, very few genuine, wise old men. And Lawrence, in many ways, was a wise old bird. And to be a wise old man, a genuine wise old man, I'm not talking about being Sir Isaiah Berlin, who as I saw wrote about the other day as the wisest man in England. Um, you have to be someone who is essentially a spiritual, uh, speaking for the spiritual dimension in, 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 in all of us. Uh, because uh, what wise means, it comes from the word vision. It means seeing, not seeing physically, of course, but seeing inwardly and seeing the, uh, the deeper patterns of things. And in that sense, Lawrence had a, he was, he was essentially, he wasn't a rational calculating thinker. He was a very, very deeply intuitive man. The thing he taught me most was to trust the spirit in yourself and to guard it, and to not care, really, what other people are wanting you to do, or to try not to, because it's very hard not to worry about that all the time. Now, Lawrence had huge kind of moral energy he had a huge spirit um and so you always felt it was rather easier for him to believe in himself than it might be for you to believe in yourself but i suppose that what he gave you was the sort of the, the sense that that was in sense your responsibility that you were kind of freighted with a, a a self or a personality that you had to cherish it's for you to make choices about 
what you believe in, what you value, what you want to do. I suppose the other thing was um, the courage to um, feel and believe things, certain things, that other people might tell you you were daft. I always remember him as a man, as a friend, who when the chips were down, that I could turn to him and ask for help. And no matter how busy he was, he would give it. We phoned each other almost every Sunday night for more than 25 years. And his first question always was, what can I do for you, old Ian? And I told him, you've done, you've changed my life. What more can you do, Larry? I think he was very much more vulnerable than most people know. I think one of the keys to his character, which I don't think many people know, is he told me the story once with such sadness that he always knew his father didn't really like him. His father just really didn't like him and he knew he wasn't his mother's favourite child and I think that that hurt remained with him for the rest of his life. And that kind of vulnerable thing of, he wanted love terribly, he needed admiration and he needed love, and I think that was the source of it. One of the lasting memories I'll have of Lawrence is at his 90th birthday party for his friends. Christopher Booker and John Aspinall were there and we were a little group talking about the countryside, what was happening uh, to the wildlife, to the world. Wonderful talk, warm and, and relaxed. He was obviously frail, but very alert, very interested, and uh, he was a lovely man. When he saw me, you know, he held my hand, and uh, he never let go of it for about, I don't know, 15 minutes. I knelt, actually, because I, I got tired standing up and holding the hand, so I then knelt down to him, probably in a very suitable position at his feet, in a humble position, not one I normally take up with most males or females of my particular species anyway. So I'm prepared to kneel at the feet of a great gorilla or a bull elephant. I'm not that keen to kneel at the feet of human beings, but I was happy to be there in the proper position. Sir Lawrence van der Post died two days after his 90th birthday. At the end of the African day, the first man brought back from nature an answer as full as it was clear. There is living meaning not only in the brief here and now, but also in death and beyond. Outwardly poor and himself rejected by our technological world, he walked rich in his own experience, certain of his significance in the scheme of things. And with a sense of belonging so close that he even spoke of the vultures who presided over his end as our sisters the vultures.